I'm Brandon back and welcome back to <laughs> Disturbing the Priest. Uh, we are here with this very cool uh, um, format of the show today. We are going to do our top five 80s demos uh, from, uh, yes, of course, the uh, the 80s. Um, there's a lot to choose from here. Uh, we have a very, very interesting roundtable here. Um, I'm going to introduce everyone in the order they're going to go. So first of all, the great Mark DeVito. Uh, Bay Area artist. Also, he has a new channel, um, Those Meddling Kids, which are going to be more of this format. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, also, of course, uh, the great Steve Ricardo, Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I was on your show very recently. Um, you were working for, remind me, it was it was what label? Uh, part of? Oh, uh, I worked at a bunch of labels. <laughs> Enigma, Roadrunner, Giant, Metal Blade, and A and M. Wow, got them yeah, all. Wow, wow. Uh, that was that was a long period of time, by the way. <laughs> yes, I'm very. I, I'm looking forward to your picks, uh, and then of course the uh, uh, Zach Roberts of Maidenhead guitarist, amazing thrash metal band, uh, Decapitation of a Maiden. Your debut EP came out last year. Very awesome to have you on, uh, Zach. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Of course. And then the great Mem Vom Stein of Exumer and Skull Pit, um, someone who's actually put out a demo in the 80s, uh, Immortal in Black, 1985. Shout out. Amazing sounding demo, just to kick this <laughs> off. <laughs> I don't um, know about amazing sounding, but some interesting music on there, for mm -hmm. sure. Very interesting. And uh, I don't know, man, compared to some of the demos, because I listened to a bunch getting ready for this. Some of them are like, like, what the fuck was this recorded with? <laughs> so uh, so to kick things off, uh, Mark, you're number five. All right. Well, number one, thank you all. I'm so glad that we're, we all got to share our perspectives. That's what it's all about. And that's why, you know, Brandon and I want really wanted to do this this type of uh, 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 discussion. Uh, I'm going at it from a personal fan, but also I grew up in the Bay Area, so some of the bands that I chose were friends of mine that gave me their demos. Uh, I kind of showed up on the scene around 83, 84, and that's when I really started getting to know a lot of the local bands. And uh, the ones, the best way, not only going to see them play, but also, you know, the big thing was word of mouth and tape trading and also handing off your tapes to to friends to for them to spread it around. Uh, and the first one I've got, which is uh, they're a band from the Netherlands called Elegy. And uh, I met uh, Martin Halamanto and Archie. Uh, from the band, they came over because they were doing some tours in Europe with this band that I hung out with and worked for called Laws Rocket. And anyway, so we would go to this party house that was a friend of mine's. And, you know, it, it was kind of a flop house. Everybody partied there, usually wound up drinking way too much and just crashing on the floor. And Martin and Archie came over from uh, uh, Holland and anyway, told me about their band and they weren't playing locally. They were just coming over to hang out and talk with uh, them. So I got into, uh, you know, writing letters back and forth and they sent me their demos. Uh, and the second one, they didn't even, they just wrote, they just wrote notes to me and a, a little letter on the J card, didn't even send me the J card. And I, the next letter I send them, I was like, it's really good. Can you send me the cover? I don't know what songs are on here or anything like that. So anyway, both really great, excellent. Uh, it's kind of progressive metal, but uh, fast guitar, fast and and a uh, 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 killer vocals on it as well. And um, I just it was my first actual introduction to uh, getting an actual European demo. Uh, so that's why I'm definitely interested in hearing Mem and 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 my perspective on what I was getting. Uh, I, it was it was worlds apart from what I was hearing at Ruthie's Inn. So uh, that that was just high on my list as far as like a, a notable band that uh, just I mean it's a it's a crushing demo. It's well produced. It sounds professional. 
and in in comparison to some of the other demos that I would get from time to time, it was just like, man, these guys are on on point. It's a little later on, it's like 87, 88, but still just crushingly good music. And for a demo, I was like, you know, and compared to these days standards, that could just go straight to a CD. You know, it was like a debut record. Awesome. Very cool. Well, that I, That's why I was so excited to do this. I was talking to a uh, Mark before this, cause it's like me and Zach come from su such a different place, you know, where all these demos we really found online, you know, there was no like tape trading or anything. It was all like YouTube recommendations and stuff and then personal research. So it's so cool. And, and I feel like after this, I'm going to have a lot of homework. <laughs> it's funny. Cause we don't have it. We didn't have an online back then, yeah. you know, so. <laughs> But it, it, it's kind of the same, same thing though. I mean, it's, it's YouTube is the new tape trader, you know, it's, it, it's, it, as long as you find it, that's what's uh, amazing. Yeah. I, I still find that amazing that I could still be surprised by music. I go on YouTube and do a deep dive and, and rabbit hole some stuff. And it's amazing what you'll find out there. So amazing. Yeah. And, there's uh there's this band labyrinth from uh, Houston. They're a thrash metal band up and coming and like their demos all over the internet. And it's so cool that like getting your demo out was like so easy. Now, like every like it's so easy to spray. You don't have to like buy a bunch of fucking, you know, uh, hard cases of cassettes and like get a like write all the <laughs> draw all the art and shit. Uh, it's so much easier. Um, all right, Steve, you're up. Oh, we're only we're doing one at a time. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I only have one of the demos that I was going to talk about in my hand, but I just stumbled across it yesterday, and I was like, I got to talk about this. The first prong demo. Oh my God. Okay. And awesome. the way I got this is uh, when I was doing this punk label, uh, Giant Records in New York, I did have a couple of metal bands, but mostly punk. I used to go to the hardcore matinee at CBGB's every Sunday afternoon. And the sound man was Tommy Victor from Prong. <laughs> so one day, you know, this is, you know, this is. I never thought prong was going to become as big as they were, you know, back. You don't know when you're first talking to someone. I'd never had seen the band and he gave it to me and I was like, this is really good, man. They ended up putting out their first record self-titled and, uh, but you know, they've had a great career. I mean, you just never know back, you know, like this is real old school. Someone handed it to you, obviously. Most of the demos I have were mailed to me, but to get it handed directly to you, it's something that you don't forget. And in fact, I saw Tommy a couple of years ago in Pittsburgh when Prong was on tour. And I reminded him that I had the first demo. He was like, probably worth money. And you know what? He's right. It is worth money. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. We, right. we, um, I grew up in Germany before I immigrated to the States and um, Prong was a, one of those bands that were really mysterious to us because they, we knew that they came from a punk hardcore background, but they had these crushing crossover medley riffs. So that band was always very special to people in Europe because, you know, they were just kind of a mystical band. Um, and we didn't, you, and the, and one of the reasons is because you can't really easily put them in a category, in a category yeah. right? And and so it, it was just a such it's such a cool band. And you having um had the opportunity to uh get it from Tommy, it's just amazing. So that's yeah, a big story too. I don't think they even had played very many shows at, at that time either. You know, this is 1987. Um, and I think their first Damn. record came out in 89. So this is real. Wow. Early. Amazing. Can I, can I just say one other thing? I've been the Ruthie's Inn in Berkeley. I love that place. You mentioned Ruthie's. Oh, yeah. Something about that. <laughs> well, That's... I'm sure it's a lot like CBGB's. Where yeah. it, like, it was the CBGB's. The bathroom was always the... overflowing with right. water. And... <laughs> Those are the best rooms, man. Best rooms. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Zach, you're number five. So my number five, I'd say probably Demolition Hammer, uh, Necrology. Uh, I kind of did some research on this because I mostly am a fan of their first record, Tortured Existence. And listening to the demo recently, 
is a lot of the same songs and the production was like insanely good where it could have been straight to to record whatever right when that came out if you listen to it i mean it sounds almost as good as the final product in my opinion and uh hearing that yeah i just thought that was really 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 legit for that time like anybody who got that demo must have been like wow this quality is crushing i mean the riffs they had were insanely good too awesome band uh I'm sad that i slept on that demo for so long i, I really a lot of these uh demos i have listed uh i had to dig for a little bit i already knew about some of them a little bit but i mostly listen to like bands first releases so i had to do some uh investigating a bit and that one really stuck out i just looked up some of my favorite bands and uh yeah i mean i don't know what they recorded with but it was like professional quality i think probably 1987 maybe is when that came out not sure but yeah that's that's my number five some good stuff I, I listened to it very recently because we talked about it and it's it sounds fucking great. Like it yeah. it, it sounds really good for, for what was it, eighty seven? I think I can't remember off the top of my head, um, but I'm pretty sure eighty seven, I think Tortured Existence was eighty nine maybe or eighty eight. So really close and a lot of the same tracks too. Like uh forty four caliber brain surgery sounds almost just as good. I mean like a step below the tortured existence it's so close i don't know again what they recorded with but uh my opinion if, if i were in that band at that time i would have been happy with that being like the first official album yeah it's so interesting it could you never know if it's literal the 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 literal album recording i i found out recently that morbid saint the lock up your children demo is literally the same yeah. recording as spectrum which is crazy <laughs> Oh, wow. I had no same? idea. Yeah, the exact same recording. That could happen. Um, a lot of bands <laughs> demos became their first album. Crazy. You know? Yeah, the quality is good enough. I mean, and that's a, also a great band, Morbid Saint, hell yeah. 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 Great. All right, Mem, your number five. All right. So just like people over here would um look for things in Europe, it was vice versa with us. So we would look over to the States. And um, every demo and tape that we would get would be a big deal, especially if it was crushing. So um, this is Overkill, Blood Donor uh, Donors, uh, Blood Metal Donors. Um, I have it as an album. I don't have, I used to have the tape. All my tapes are long gone, except a few. Um, this is very special to us. Um, to me, that was my introduction to Overkill, which is, you know, one of the the premier bands out of this area new york um new jersey so um yeah the whole look of the demo the feel of the demo the songs it was just amazing like hearing that and you were briefly touching upon um uh metallica's demo which is fine but that was like the the initial wave of that whole scene right um the stuff that I am going to discuss is more like stuff that really blew up 83, 84, like, you know, not 82. Um, and that is really also when I started getting into tape trading. Um, I had a friend who had like a massive collection and yeah. So, and then prior to working for metal hammer, um, well, we would get stuff mailed to us. Uh, it was, straight up tape trading and learning about bands from the from the u.s through uh, via that ve vehicle and this uh demo sticks out and it's i think it still crushes to this day amazing amazing now so, uh can i ask a question yeah so from your perspective from germany because uh -huh. i mean our i grew up like loving and like i found breaker in a in a budget store and it's I, I was like, oh my God, okay. I knew about Scorpions and right, right. German precision metal was like, yeah. okay, this is the new level, guys. We got to yeah. get, put the punk stuff back a little ways and, and let's clean it up a bit and get fast. And I, I always, was that attracted you to Overkill as opposed to hearing? Because the, the early Metallica stuff was that punky kind of no. trying to collect. Where the, the, the thing was overkill um i mean the 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 tape looked awesome 
Um, they, I saw pictures of them and zines and stuff. They were very metal. Like, yeah. you know, it wasn't, and it had a tinge of punk to it. If you, they, you know, yeah. um, being from this area anyway, you know, but, um, but it was like very metal. And I loved even like, I don't know. Um, I mean, I started going to shows in 81 and um, you're talking about Accept. I saw Accept opening up um, on a triple bill for Priest. So it was Priest headlining, Leopard um, uh, special guests and main, uh, uh, main support and um, and Accept special guests for the Breaker tour. So oh, <laughs> that was a pretty good show. Right? Damn. And um, so that was in 81. And um, when that whole thing, like that was kind of like the initiation of just like, all right, let's just see straight up metal stuff that also had the feel and the imagery of metal. And I think that Overkill demo, the way it was presented and the packaging and everything, that was very much metal to us. So yeah, but you know, the grass is always greener. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. so to German, us, Germans was, kept a very clear, clean cut lawn. Right. <laughs> it was very. I mean, it was like that. But, that grass is green, but it's well groomed and it's fast. <laughs> but I'm gonna tell I'm, when you, when I get into one of my later picks, it's get it's gonna get messy. So okay, good. All right, let's get dirty. looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. So uh, so my uh my number five is uh Evil Sinners uh second demo from 1988 uh. It's a band from Belgium. I actually, this is the only band in my whole uh, five that I discovered through their demo. Um, just popped up on YouTube one day, and I thought the logo looked kind of cool. It's it's a very generic name, I guess, but I, I listened to it, and it's like you put new wave of British heavy metal, you put thrash metal, you put doom metal, you put all of this in a blender, and I feel like that's what this band is. And there's like a bit of like almost like a bit of like death metal in in some of the playing it's it's a, so much of everything but it's so well balanced and i love the sound of the demo i actually sometimes even prefer it over their uh debut record because of the the grittiness and the eeriness it just fits so well with with everything the the lyrics the tone um there's a bit of like black sabbath in their riffs too it's just so good um apparently they changed their name i couldn't really find a ton more on evil center um if any of you guys know <laughs> more about them but it's it's one of those demos i just keep going back to um it's on youtube it's a, it's amazing um the gang kicks off the the demo and it's so good i i prefer the demo version of that song if anything um but but yeah that's my number five evil center i'm gonna check it out the name is the most generic name ever. But it's <laughs> it is, and it has like a very like almost like glam logo too. Um, but it's there's something about it. I, I don't know what drew me to it, but it's it's there's so many. It, it's one of those bands where like all their influences are just on their sleeve, and they're pulling from like everything, like seventies, eighties, um, and like even like more extreme metal. So it's it's great. It's really, I'm really good. Check some of that out too. That's my favorite stuff when you can blend so many different styles of music into one thing. That's what Me I look too. for even with newer bands now. Uh, I love that stuff. So. Hell yeah, man! But it's great. Definitely check it out, Evil Center. Um, all right, uh, that's our that's our f number five. Let's go back to uh Mark DeVito for our fourth oh, pick. Geez. All right. Well, I think I met I mentioned before Ruthie's in, and back then. You know, your Death Angels and Possessed and Exodus, those guys, those are your weekend bands that you're paying top dollar, five, six, eight dollars sometimes. Um, but during the rest of the week, they would have bands play in the afternoon for like two bucks, a buck or whatever. And one of the house bands, we called it, the, you know, the, the Wednesday house band at Ruthie's Inn was a band called Pillage Sunday. And uh, these were some friends of mine, but uh, but Jumbo, the singer, 
was also did double duty. He was the singer for a, a band called Spastic Children, which featured various rotating members of uh, of uh, Met Metallica. Uh, famously, uh, Cliff Burton, who was it was his birthday yesterday. yesterday. Um, was uh, joined the band after going to a Rush show uh and and sitting with fred cotton who was also he he was in the band as well he was a singer rotated singer uh but anyway uh james hatfield was good friends with fred and long story short somehow convinced cliff to play in this band but uh pillage sunday were uh scotty kofer and uh a couple other uh guys and they used to they were a fun party crossover thrash punky band. Uh, this is an excellent demo. It came out in 87 and uh, a little later on. But again, I, it, it, they put the time into making a great sounding demo. And although some of the songs are silly, they're professionally well done. It's good production, catchy, crunchy uh, riffs. And uh, I, I it's called The Blitz Has Begun, and they've got, you know, such memorable tunes as Early Riser, Butt Rape, and uh, and uh, Sister History. Uh, but th they, they were unique where, I mean, it was kind of, it was a party band, singer, you know, one, one, one great show. He, he drank so much, I mean, he was a prodigious drinker, this big guy named Jumbo, Rich Sealer. Uh, who was no longer with us, unfortunately, a good friend of mine. But uh, he passed out halfway through the show, and and so they brought out a folding chair and sat him up there, and they did the rest of the show because they, they wanted to get paid their seven dollars each or whatever for the for the event. But uh, they would have uh, a girl in a bikini come out in between songs, and and a card girl like the old boxing and uh, wrestling, and they would and and it had the the next day. They were they had fun, and it was fun to watch them, and they were good, and they brought this element of fun. It was like they were enjoying themselves, no matter what. If anybody else was enjoying them, mostly it was all friends. And for two bucks, you go down and support your friends. You have a couple drinks in the parking lot and you go and watch them play. And it was always a good show, always fun. And and they would do creative, wacky things on stage. And 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 it's surprisingly when when Scotty handed me their their tape, I listened to it and I was like, this is really good. <laughs> you deserve much better than to be the two dollar, you know, Wednesday afternoon at Ruthie's in band. Uh, and one of those, one of those local guy uh, bands that really deserve to uh, at least be in the Big Twelve or something. So uh, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a hierarchy that uh, even and you know they they were touching on greatness from time to time. Well, a lot from, of fun from, in a party. From girls in bikinis to butt rape, they were touching on greatness. <laughs> they, 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 no question. They, they checked a lot of boxes for us as kids. You know. <laughs> What uh, what's the status of them now? Currently, uh, as I just uh, my uh, Rich Birch, uh, uh, sorry, Rich Birch, Rich uh, Sealer Jumbo, the singer is no longer with us. Um, unfortunately, a lot of there's a lot of casualties uh, from that era. I'm sure we all grew up with friends uh, in the scene uh that the you know the party never ended until it ended, and then uh, and so. They're 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 defunct. Uh, Scotty Cofer, who was the guitarist and main writer for the band, is still around. Does a lot of pickup things, but wife and kids and living in San Jose, and he'll do pickup shows and have has fun still. But you know, you, you, you can't go back. Uh, so uh, and definitely, you know, there's nothing appealing about a sixty year old man uh, singing about butt rape. <laughs> uh, especially at the pizza, well, the pizza you know. stage so you, you it's not into. really it's frowned upon but still great guys still you know permanently 14 in in our intellect and anyway Th thank you for getting this podcast canceled now i don't have this competition anymore to worry about 
That's right. Butt rape. That's it. You're off. Yeah, yeah. We got to rip the bandit off at some point, you know. <laughs> all right, Steve, you're up. That was good. I don't know if I could top that. Uh, you guys are going to all hate me after this, but it's true. It's true. It's a true story. I was working at Enigma Records. I got a three song demo in the mail from the Great Cat. And I got it and I was like, this is the sickest thing ever. And I, I had the postcard that the rejection postcard, and I sent it back and I said, keep, keep in touch. Let me know what else you got, you know, because I was like, this is crazy, man. It was like Beethoven on speed, you know, and um, <laughs> the great cat flew to L.A. but didn't tell me she was coming to L.A. I was in L.A. She was in New York just because I was the only label that answered, you know, responded to her demo. So I kept a relationship going with her. And then when I went to Roadrunner, sorry, guys, but I signed the great cat. Now, I've taken a lot of grief from that from people over the years, believe it or not. Um, but um, I'm proud of it. I think it was a unique signing and she was absolutely fucking insane. Plus, she's a Juilliard trained violinist. I mean, that... Uh, that was a move that I made. That was I, I didn't know if I'd be able to get Case Wessels, who's the owner of Roadrunner, to agree with it. But I got him. I got him. And their record sold well. They, they did, I left the label after the first record. But Monty Connor took over, <laughs> regretfully, as her A&R person. And you know, he, he held that against me for a while, I think. But I think he learned to love the gray cat, even though she doesn't love him or anyone else. But I think she loves me. I don't know. Awesome. Great story. Good diversity with that pick. <laughs> really, really good. All right. I got so a risky. I got a risky. Or... Hard time about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. The hell with anybody that gave you a hard time about signing the great cat. I mean, that's like signing a stalker. <laughs> that's <laughs> well. If you're familiar with the New York metal scene from that era, those guys were all like thought they knew everything. I'm not going to mention any of the writers' names or anything. You know, I lo like them all, but they just did not want anyone in getting in their way of their click. You know, the the New York metal click. Yeah, they're all over. Clicks are all over them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, Zach, you're uh, you're number four. Uh, number four, I'd say when Testament was called Legacy, uh, their first mm -hmm. demo, Zetro, that was that was really cool. Uh, really speaking in New York, appreciate hearing Steve Zetro. Yeah, <laughs> see, uh, hearing him on there. I'm more of a fan of his vocals, honestly. So I think I prefer that demo over the uh, first release. And uh, I don't know if you were Brandon at that show couple years ago where exodus and testament played together i think he came out with death angel right oh. yeah 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 that was, yeah, really I was cool. at that so got a little, little live taste of that so awesome i prefer his vocals on that demo actually yeah. <laughs> it's so weird Likewise, um sorry um to interrupt but the um, the demo was obviously the first thing we heard from testament when they were legacy yeah. And I thought the vocals were awesome. And when he went to Exodus, I was devastated because I'm such a Paul Bella fan. And oh. um, and I can just underline what you're saying uh, is, is that his vocals fit like a glove onto that music, right? And then when the first album dropped, it was like, eh. And so, yeah, everything you said is spot on. Uh, uh, yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah, I that, do too. That demo, I actually prefer over the legacy. Yeah, likewise. I don't know. He's just got a great voice, and I think it's kind of funny. I just had a conversation about Steve Zetro with uh, my buddy Nick Petrino, who plays guitar for uh, D. Snyder. We were talking about his vocals, and he's like, I, I could never get into his style of vocals. And I'm like, dude, it's just, uh, I don't know, thrash ACDC. And ever since I said that to him, he's like, all right, now i got to re listen to this because. I think I like it now. Yeah, it's a little bit better if you put it that way. Well said. <laughs> well said. Um, all right, Mem, you're number four. All right. So um, I started on the East Coast. Now I'm going to go to the West Coast. High Rack. Ooh, hell yeah. First uh, demo. Um, another one of those demos that were so instrumental for my 
you know, for my forming years, um, just listen to shit out of that demo all the time. And, um, and uh, one of my good friends, Mike, he used to call Caton uh, on the phone. Just, you know, we, we got his phone number because one of our friends who worked at a zine was talking to him and, you know, and up to this day, now I'm, I'm, I'm friends with Kate, but um, before then, you know, he was a dude who had a demo out that everybody knew about. Then he was signed to Metal Blade. So he was a big deal. Right. And he, and I mean, how many black kids were there representing our style? True. Right. Um, so he was really like this unicorn, like this, and he was so friendly. So anyway, Mike would call him and we would just all be around the phone and be like, all right. And it would take turns talking to him. And then many years later, when um, him and I uh, played, our bands played uh, at some open air show here and uh, out there in Europe, um, and I'd say, Kate, you, you know, you were such a big deal back in the day. And like, and now we play together and it's like, and he was like, yeah, the, what a trip. And I'm like, he's only a few years older than me, right? I'm 56. I think he just turned 60. And um, anyway, so those are my memories and um, important demo, important band for us. And still, he, he, he you know, he kicks ass. Um, matter of fact, we're going out uh, and we're going to be playing some of the same festivals in the summer. Uh, we are sharing um, the same... Um, agency now um a booking agency so yeah awesome they're they're putting out a record yes it's coming out yeah. Yeah. yeah i've been trying to talk i've been talking to kate and about coming back on my show because i love high racks you know <laughs> they, were, they were one of the cool bands at metal blade when i was there dude i've been trying to get i've been trying to get that guy on my show for i want to say i, I want to say 11 months now <laughs> Like I'll, I'll hit him up every like three months, be like, "Hey, man, you know," and you know? it just never works out. But he's he, pretty busy, very busy, especially with the new release. Um, amazing, so like such an underrated band from that era. Honestly, yeah. not enough people talk about them. All right, it's true. That's true. My number five, um, Hellhammer Death Fiend. Uh, this was uh, nineteen eighty three. Um, I want to say maybe my favorite bass tone in any demo I've ever heard ever. Something about that bass tone is so it just itches my brain in like the the right way. It is so good. You got like that like almost like elements of punk in it, like a bit of discharge almost. Like it's so cool. It's like proto black metal. It's uh it's such an interesting thing and like of course the EP is legendary and everything, but uh and I think there were like 3 Hellhammer demos. If so I'm, Triumph of Death and Death Fiend are pretty much the same demo. Yeah, yeah. So, um, um, I do like the recording on a uh, Death Fiend mm -hmm. um, more, but yeah, it's it's got like nine. It's got nine tracks on it. It's a thirty-two minute demo. Um, it's it's fucking awesome. I can't imagine how how much an original <laughs> of fucking like I would kill to have one of these. Um, but yeah, that's my uh, that's my number four pick um death fiend 1983 hold where that were they <laughs> sorry where right. were they from switzerland switzerland, switzerland. Yeah. Wow, okay um very good very like it's it's pra it's pretty much proto black metal like it's so fucking good mark, um, I heard, yeah. mark you know celtic frost right celtic frost yeah celtic frost yeah yeah yeah, yeah. what Those are that was pre pre Celtic Frost. The same oh, band, wow. except yeah. Oh, that's right. It's a uh, Tom G Warrior or whatever. Yeah. It is. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's weird. I discovered both of those bands at the same time. I me because too. We, we found about hell. I found out about Hellhammer after Celtic Frost. I'm like, they had another band, and their records are so weird looking, man. It was very dark. I mean, dark is it? They did. They're one of the original dark metal bands. You'd have to say, right? One hundred percent. And I'll yeah. be talking about them later because um, there's a lot to talk about. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but as for me, like you know, uh, when it comes to like, like of course, me and Zach, it's all internet stuff for us. It's it's no word of mouth. So when I came across that, it was it was definitely a rabbit hole of like, holy fuck. And then it's like their other demos. And then of course the the iceberg 
that is like, you know, that you can start there and the music you can go that rabbit hole is insane. So yeah, that's, that's my uh, number four pick. So we are back to our, uh, to Mark DeVito. Uh, now at number three. All right. Uh, another local Bay area band, uh, friends of mine I grew up with, uh, Sacrilege BC. Awesome. Uh, great, great band. And uh, this was back when they were Sacrilege, which we affectionately had always known them as Sacrilege until they decided to put out a record and uh, found out that there was a European band uh, called Sacrilege. They battled it out and went nowhere, unfortunately, with it. So they had added BC to it. But we another also another band that started out as a Ruthie's in middle of the week, all underage kids playing this crossover punky thrash stuff. Uh, and then, I mean, they were so good and talk about uh, uh, having a black member in your band or, uh, or there was another band called Stone Vengeance, which I won't get into until later. Uh, all black band and they crushed it and we used to tease saying that they were the original black metal band uh but they played thrash uh but anyway uh sacrilege was a a a, a great great bay area band uh and found their way onto bills like with possessed exodus and so on and so forth but the beauty of this band, too, is that they fit so well with the punks. And Ruthie's Inn was a punk venue, as at the same time it was a metal venue. And like Motorhead, who had blazed the trail for that, that bridge that I always said, you could walk into any show with a Motorhead patch on your jacket, and you were welcomed, no matter if it was a GBH uh discharge or metallic or exodus you that that they were switzerland they were right in the middle you know i mean and, and everyone loved and respected them sacrilege was our bay area motorhead as far as i was concerned and uh they would play with attitude adjustment and verbal abuse and 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 i think that that was instrumental this was a, such a well done demo um and it was so well received, handed out by by Streffen mostly. He even put his his home phone number on the back, which was back when uh, the area code made sense and it wasn't Sa San Francisco anymore. But uh, uh, they they were great, and they bridged they bridged that gap, but used it to their benefit because they were constantly being asked to play on punk bills and metal bills. So they played more and got more stage time than I would say, you know, Exodus would play once a week. Sacrilege would play three times a week. And then, you know, they played two times during the week at Ruthie's uh, in the afternoon and, and doing their own gig. Or, and then they'd be on the bill with Possessed or, or Exodus the next, that weekend. So they were making more money they put more time and effort into their uh, their demo, which I mean, paid off. I I compare this to the the legacy demo uh, as far as its sound and production, and I I think it blows you no know, life to leather and the and the Church Street demos for uh, Exodus out of the water as far as quality. And they recently reissued for Record Store Day their uh their debut album party with god oh, and, cool. and the demo is on there as a second piece of vinyl and it's it's a it's it's well worth the listen it uh a, a crushing crossover thrash band from the bay area that uh again I, i'll keep saying out when they said the big four I, I think they 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 missed they missed a lot of people that really deserve to be at least on a rotating fifth stage basis. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Party with God, so fucking good. Amazing. Oh, such a good album. Amazing. And 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 such good guys, local and 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 Moose Lethridge, who was their bass player, wrote a lot of that early stuff. Black gentleman, 
great guy. Uh, he played with another band called Wanted later on, uh, Eric Thomas on drums, and uh, just br brilliant songwriter, great riffs, and, 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 and songsmiths to no end. They're great, great stuff. Awesome, awesome. Steve, you're up. You know, you reminded me of an all-black metal band, Snow White. Z oh, yeah, Snow White from Chicago. Another they great band phenomenal yeah. in yeah. fact actually i don't think they were all black didn't they have a white girl singer with three yeah. black guys yeah yes. sorry but no white yeah yeah and xavier <laughs> xavier was all black but they were more polished kind of power metal but uh good good stuff yeah no they're, they're, they're quality stuff <laughs> I, i'll have to check i've never heard of them snow white yeah oh, really Z -Z yeah. yeah chicago band the umlauts yes Another band good. with the outs. <laughs> yeah, they were like thrash. They were thrashy, pretty thrashy. Yeah, thrashy. Yeah. They were very thrashy. really. Yeah. yeah, great band. I'll check um, them out. I'm gonna just throw three more at you right now, and then let you guys get on with it. I apologize for having to leave a little no early, but uh, this one I didn't have on my list, but I have to do it because you know we're talking about Ruthie's in in Berkeley so much. My friend, Rachel Matthews, who used to work at the record factory, she was the buyer up there in San Francisco. She kept telling me about this band that I need to come and see. And I went up there and checked them out. They weren't as heavy as the bands we're talking about, but they fall close to the metal category. Jet Boy was their name. They wow. had a really good first demo. They ended up getting signed uh, to two different major labels, but they just couldn't get it off the ground, man. It was one of those things that... I thought they were going to be a bigger band. They just missed that L.A. glam scene by maybe, I think they came along. Well, no, actually, they were around in 84, but they were yeah. they seemed like they got signed afterwards. But I saw them at Ruthie's Inn, <laughs> and I had their first demo. So um, I wanted to talk about INC, Indestruct Indestructible Noise Command from Bridgeport, Connecticut, a band that I'm happy and proud to say that I did sign. I was working at Roadrunner Records in Holly Lane, the late Holly Lane. I don't know if you, any of you guys knew her. She worked for other labels too, but I met her. We opened the New York office for Roadrunner. She had given me INC's demo and I held that thing for like a year and they no one was signing them or anything. And then when I started Giant Records, even though I had you know, dag, nasty, verbal assault, government issue, all these punk bands. I'm like, I could sign a metal band. And I signed those guys. And we put two records out, the self-titled one and the visitor. And they were from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Fantastic band, INC. Very good. Um, no, uh, okay, I'll just bum you guys out completely with my last one, okay? <clears throat> Once again, I don't know why I'm apologizing for bands I that I signed, <laughs> but, you know, this happens over the years, you know, you start feeling like people attack you for things and don't like, I signed this band and I didn't talk about them for about two years after I signed them, but when I was working at Enigma also, this is in 84, these girls that worked there were constantly raving me about this band you got to come and see this band they give me flyers all the time whatever finally i went to the troubadour and i saw them and when i got there i noticed the line outside had about 200 people in it which the place hold and 180 of them were girls and i'm like this will be interesting so i got in there and these guys came out hit the stage hard in my face and then i ended up talking to them for six months and signed them poison and i mean I'm, i know a lot of people don't like poison but you know i think <laughs> for everything they've accomplished the amount of records they sold you know shoot me if you want okay i mean i i'm i'm happy with it okay that's girls welcome diversity girls. Girls like girls. I seriously don't <laughs> think anyone that's was an exhumer is going to think much of poison. <laughs> uh, Anybody that was okay. in a metal band back there wished that they had that audience. So let me tell you, I'm sure they were like, yeah, I'm tired of 14-year-old boys showing up to our shows. But you where know, are the girls? 
They don't I mean, it's less than this. <laughs> I, I, I didn't get to spend my whole career doing metal, so I kind of am all over the place. I signed Eviction to Metal Blade, Pittsburgh band. They were, had a really good demo. They were great, you know. So there were a lot of good demos that came. Vernon, Vernon it said Vernon Reads Living Color. When I got that demo, I was like, what's this? And I went and saw them at CB's, and I couldn't believe what I saw. Of course, they get, they get signed to Epic Records. But um, I know I kind of didn't follow the format. And I apologize that. Apologize I mean, for that. I want to talk to you about Jet Boy. I feel bad now. I want to go, 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 oh, man. go no, no, well, <laughs> Fernand, Fernando, Billy. I even remember some of the guys. They were really good guys. Oh man. yeah, Billy. I, Billy plays with Buck Cherry now. Buck Cherry, yeah, that's who we went to. Buck and, Cherry. Uh, Jet Boy, Sea Hags were another local band in that genre that were like. Man, talk about an explosion. Uh, but Davey Vane, I mean, those guys are local. The, the metal, the crowd in the Bay Area, at least, Billy hung out with everybody. You know, they were they weren't metal, they weren't punk, but they were they were in the metal scene. Not all the Primus guys, I, the genre stuff. If anybody gives you crap, tell them, hey, you know, those guys got a pedigree. Those guys, you know, that they, they, they were wow. locally respected by everybody. You know, whatever. Please. I just know I'm dealing with some heavy dudes right here on this show, so I'm kind of being apologetic. My crew, no, no, no. My crew was my neighbor, man. I, <laughs> I love Todd. I went to high school with Todd. Was he heathens from San Francisco, right? Who heathen? He, heathen, San Francisco. Oh, I got a quick yeah. heathen story. I had those guys signed <laughs> and agreed to sign to Roadrunner. Total agreement. Yeah. They fucking. Oh, I'm sorry. Can we swear on your podcast? Yeah, you, I, I feel like we're past that. Combat Records stole them from me. The night before they were going to sign their contract, their lawyer called me the next day and said, we're really sorry, but we're going to go with Combat. I'm like, what? The, the irony is they ended up signing with Roadrunner years later. But, you know, I had them the first time and they <laughs> Combat. Combat wow. Records was a big player at that time. Combat, Megaforce, Metal Blade were like the big three in terms of those independent metal labels. Todd Carew was like a buddy of mine from high school. He was a couple years older than me, but when I came into high school, he was there. He was the original bass player for Jet Boy, and they got some, they got on the Guns N' Roses tour uh, when Welk. Uh, when Appetite for Destruction. So I was painting Todd Cruz's mom's house when he would show up with Slash nodding out on heroin and sitting in their bedroom and, and, and it's rocking back and forth. And I didn't know Guns N' Roses from Adam and I just knew Todd because I bummed cigarettes from him in high school. And then I was, uh, I found out that they were going to be, they were going to be playing, they're on tour with, with Guns N' Roses. So I was, my, my family was going to go to England and I was like, fuck, I can go see them at the famous Marquee Club. It's going to be you know, got Jet Boy opening for Guns N' Roses. And I, I got out there. Todd had overdosed in Slash's <sighs> apartment in New York about a week before he was getting there. This is before the Internet. I didn't know anything. I go over to England. I'm drunk as a skunk. And I walk up to the front of the stage. That's not that's not Todd. <laughs> What the fuck's going on? You don't know anything. And then I saw, you know, Guns N' Roses and it was good and all that. I got back to the States and I finished his mom's house and his mom was like, yeah, Todd died like a week, two weeks ago. And I was like, oh my God. But I mean, that's how things just happened back then. It's like, you just find out. It's just crazy stuff. You know, when Rachel said you were going to see this band Jet Boy, you know, the first thing I said to her was, are they a New York Dolls cover band? Because, <laughs> you know, New York yeah, yeah. Dolls. Song, yeah. I'd never heard that before until they took the name from the song, which they're not the first band to do that. But, you know. Yeah, the singer had the big mohawk. And... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was great. Good stuff. Cool. Awesome. Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. Go subscribe. And uh, you can follow on Spotify and everywhere you go to find your podcast. So thank you, man. For joining hey, us. Thanks. hey, you guys are awesome, man. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm leaving, but I really enjoyed it, man. Incredible. Good meeting you. Thank you. Thanks for joining Good us, man. Come on back. Come on back sometime. Well, do, let's do it again. Maybe I'll have to have it on my show. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Later. Hell yeah. See you, man. Awesome. All right. And then there was four. All right. Zach, 
You're up. Right. So number three, Toxic Wasteland. Awesome demo. Pretty long for a demo. I think it was like hitting the 30 minute mark or something like that. And again, it's a lot of the stuff that came out on uh, World Circus comes in with uh, the song Heart Attack. I was listening to it earlier today just uh, for a refresher, and it's a, it's a little slower. The songs are like World Circus songs, but a little bit, uh, tempo's a little bit slower. Um, but pretty similar, and the quality was fantastic as well. It kind of reminded me of the uh, Demolition Hammer quality I was talking, like step below uh, finished album type quality. But uh, the singer was just as great for sure, and all the playing. I think there were, some of the guitar solos were different. Uh, than on the actual record, and it's interesting to hear that. I, I couldn't tell you which one I prefer. Uh, I think they maybe refined it a little bit more for the finished product on the, the album World Circuits, but the guitar work with those guys is always phenomenal. So, yeah, that's a that's a really cool demo, really long demo. I think it's like eight songs, something like that. Uh, wow. I forget what year that one came out, but probably just a year or two years before World Circus, something like that. Yeah, that's that's my number three. Some good stuff. I'll have to check that out. That's a demo I've never listened to. You neither. I mean, if you if you like uh, World Circus, it's like all all that stuff pretty much. I think there's like I wrote down some notes. I think there's there's a few songs that I don't think are on World Circus, but I mean, it's all ballpark that that kind of stuff. It comes out right with Art Attack. Um, the song Wasteland is pretty sick. Yeah, I recommend it. If you like toxic for sure yeah I'll, I'll i'll definitely check that out after this i i have like five hours of listening to do i feel <laughs> after yeah. this oh my god all right awesome man awesome all right mem you're number three all right so i finally i'm going to go back to where i grew up and sodom and um oh, yeah. Back then, they had two demos. The first, I, I started to get on the Sodom train with the second demo, Victims of Death, uh, which is also the shirt. And, um, and I mean, talk about chaos and bad production and just a hot mess. However, um, they were pretty much the only band out of Germany that was as bold to do that. And um, I remember, um, so I was a big, I mean, I, we were, you know, I was a scene guy in Frankfurt. And I remember, funny story, um, uh, one of my friends who was the, the president of the Venom's Legions in Germany, Matthias, he put together the show with Sodom headlining, Destruction and Tankard. And um, I was in 84 and, and they, they didn't have a record out. And we all made fun of Sodom because they were so chaotic. And he was at, at the time, he was also, Tom was in the military. So he had to cut off his hair. And he had that weird um, haircut, you know, like look like somebody put a fucking pot on his head and then somebody cut his bangs. It's just <laughs> looking ridiculous, right? Anyway, so, um, and Venom, they were there to sign autographs. Um, long story short, Venom, um, uh, came there, but it was only Abaddon and, and, and Mantis and Kronos got arrested during, a a, a phone, uh, a, a, a radio interview where he smashed the, in Holland, where he smashed the studio for some reason, somebody pissed him off and he smashed it. So he got arrested. So there was only two of them. And then as the night you know, everybody got more drunk. Everybody, you know, things were heating up. Tankard was awesome. Uh, I think it was the first or second show ever. Wow. And uh, we were hanging out. Uh, and I, I remember, you know, we're sitting at the bar and and Gaga, he was um, rehearsing his lyrics. He was reading his lyric. And it was just a very memorable night. Anyway, Destruction came on stage and they had some mess ups during, you know, fucking up the songs a little bit. But at that point, um, Tom was already drunk, so he went behind um, the amps of uh, the destruction amps and um, unplugged the amps. So he wanted to sabotage their show because he was jealous. Huge chaos, right? So, and then finally, they came on stage, and that was supposed to be the night that they were going to get signed. 
to um to SPV. And it was a disaster. Like he was drunk, he was falling off. I mean, it was just a it, but it was such a shit show. But it was so memorable that when they got signed, that the 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 head of SPV said, I had to sign this band because they were so bad that I knew that they would sell records because it was borderline comical. And <laughs> So that's my story for Sodom back in those days. Um, obviously, now they're well-respected band. One of uh, one of uh, the pioneers of of the movement that I'm part of. And uh, anyway, uh, so Sodom, Victims of Death, hot mess. But I love that demo. And uh, yeah, if you don't know it, check it out. That's awesome. What a good story! Oh my god! Oh wow! Those days. Jesus Christ. It, it, it's so funny. Sorry, what year was that? 1984. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jesus. It, it's yeah. so funny because like I feel like with like like me, it's like I found this demo, you know, I was I was drunk on YouTube where <laughs> you guys have such amazing stories attached to some of the some of the like music and stuff. It's so cool to hear. Um now uh for my uh for my pick it's going to be the uh creeping death demo oh my bad die by his hand demo um 1983 um kirk hammett only two songs on this um i love the guitar work um vocals you know really what else is there to say um it's just such a cool what if demo um what if kirk had some of like you know used some of those riffs that he kept for metallica um and he used them for exodus what if he never left exodus you know it's it's kind of it's a very cool what if scenario and i actually really love it and even the uh the riff with with paul singing over it's so cool like it's so so cool um i love everything about it the guitar work the uh the solos the songs themselves uh, um it's uh, Ender, I believe, is the second song. And uh, again, solid. Um, maybe even as good, if not better, than uh, Die By His Hand, but just so good. Um, yeah, that's that's all I really have to say about 83, too. It's Why? Not... Yeah. I mean, a anything that Paul did to me, I mean, he was like one of my biggest influences vocal-wise anyway, up to this day. And um, like, that's such a classic demo and cla those songs and like everything about it is so amazing i i, I mean i i uh, i get a little emotional when i think about it because i remember hearing those songs and i'm like i couldn't even comprehend how awesome that was <laughs> you know like that's how like yeah and i love exodus with paul like that's my favorite thrash record is right that one back there you have Bonded. Bonded by blood. That's Bonded my by favorite blood. thrash record of all times. I don't care what anybody says. Everything about that record to me is what thrash metal is. Like, that's the Bible to me. People might disagree, but whatever. To me, that's it. That's it. That's the gold gold standard right there. I agree. I agree. Especially that, like even looking that back. album, that album is like I think it could have come out yes it could have come out but but for i mean i i love those guys we would see them all the time locally paul would you know create chaos wherever you go but it was good i mean that the good clean but friendly violent fun is exactly what it was i mean he'd throw i, I think brandon and i talked about helicopter trout where he'd show up at a party and if there you saw a bunch of posers in the middle of the living room he'd take out the the garden shears and th open them up and throw them I called it helicopter trout right into the middle of the crowd i mean it was like it was it was chaos but man those guys that that's they they were like the raiders you know they'd get it all the way down to the one yard line and fumble it and the other team would run it all the way back and that was the whole thing with it. exodus i mean that that, that and that album and we knew it forwards and backwards because we'd watch it and everyone had a tape of you know the shows and oh, i was just 
is so seminal and there would be no Metallica or Slayer if it wasn't for that. And, and they all agree. And, and that was, I think still part of the reason there was a small Bay area contingency that were upset with Metallica for poaching, for poaching Kirk. Yeah. I, that's a song I'd love to see get redone or even like played live with Kirk. Has it, have they ever like really redone "Die by His Hand"? Have Metallic Exodus? Uh, you mean? Exodus, yeah. Uh, I, don't I don't think, think they ever redone. played. I know it they did. Or... "Let There Be Blood," which was a a revisit of of "Bonded by Blood" with Rob Dukes. And sorry, it, I, I I always felt like that was a mistake. You don't you don't mess with perfection. But, no, yeah. <laughs> Rob is a nice guy, but it's oh, not. it's great, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rob's he... a nice guy, but he can't, you know. It's okay to sing those those songs live, whatever, but mm -hmm. to re-record for what reason? There is no oh, reason that. to that, you know. In so, fact, you know, know. I just picked oh, this so up because my Streffen Taylor, who is in Sacrilege, painted the cover. But this, we saw this show when Exodus played. That's ah, great. Amazing. And Bailoff got back on. I mean, and great show. And 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 the vibe was amazing. 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 That's fucking amazing. awesome. And uh, but uh, yeah, that 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 whole interplay in '83 and then in '85 when you know or '80, yeah '85 when Bailoff left or was left left the band like he's out of the band and then zetro comes in and then chuck billy and all that swirling mix around and chuck was in this band called guilt with danny gill who you interviewed um uh, yeah and it, it, it but it he was he was coerced by zetro to to join that band so anyway so it's all this weird interplay and the and how everybody's looking at it and but the pieces are all fitting together somehow. Unfortunately, Exodus got the fuzzy end of the lollipop on that one, as far as I'm concerned. In in the grander scheme of things, I mean, I mean we had we had that tape of that record a year prior to its release. Exactly. So I mean, it was recorded in the can, and everybody had the tape. So when that record dropped, already. when the record dropped, we all knew it by heart. So it didn't um it almost didn't matter, but it mattered for their commercial success yeah, absolutely well, like, and then that album art that was chosen the the babies on the blanket yeah but i mean it it all fits in the big puzzle i guess yeah. it's like yeah that's that's what it should be because that's what it was it was very down and dirty but yeah man oh man that was just like oh yeah it came out yeah i know yeah okay yeah. <laughs> right exactly and, and to talk about it, it was such high regard and it, and at the time you're like yeah yeah well i've i've got yeah, I should buy the album. Yeah, why not? You know, it's like I have the tape, but I'll buy the album. Yeah, why not? So yeah. completely robbed from being in the big four. Exodus yeah, should have been sure. in a hundred percent, without yeah, question. Dude. And I mean, on a technicality way, too, man. way more than than Anthrax, anyway. In my opinion, yeah, yeah. And I'm and I and I'm I'm very good friends for Danny uh, uh, with Danny for the past twenty five years. But oh, yeah. nevertheless, you know, I mean, Exodus and Anthrax, what? Yeah. Like, you know, like, doesn't even make any sense. You know, it just seems like, oh, we got to pick a band that's not from the West Coast. So let's pick Anthrax and put them in the big four, you know? I would have said Overkill. Who fit in with Slayer, but Gary Holt. That's undeniably like, they're, I mean, no, I, I think Gary said he encountered three people the whole tenure that like had a problem with somebody in the crowd was like, you know, get off stage or whatever, but it, that it's perfect fit. And that Bay area kind of cluster it's happening now. Carrie's got, you know, yes. Bay area backup band is his band, you know, <laughs> Bill Paul and, 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 uh, Mark Asagueta. I mean, it, 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 it full circle and, yeah. You know, well, Exodus was definitely the, yeah, I feel like they were a huge influence to Metallica, to yeah. Slayer, you know? It uh, kind of the flag. Everybody Megadeth. else came up, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, but whatever, I guess. All got them to stop wearing makeup. Uh, got Slayer to stop wearing makeup. <laughs> I, it's, 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 
it's well, Ellison, you know, I, I asked Ellison about the Bay Area, and he said that when Carrie was in Megadeth and he saw Exodus for the first time, he left Megadeth and he knew exactly what he wanted to do with Slayer. It yeah, was yeah. that. It was seeing Paul and seeing, like, Exodus play. It's like, fuck, that's what, the that's the bar. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, and, and in turn, same thing with Metallica. I mean, Metallica was, like, that was the bar was set. So when Dave came back with Megadeth, he came back with, I mean, he, he had blood in his eyes. He was out, out to kill. He was, it was a vengeance. It was, he played like he was playing to say, fuck you. You know, it was, it it was, it was was just incredible. That first, that first Megadeth record, just imagine if it would have been produced correctly. Oh yeah. yeah. It's just, just, I mean, I love the production now, but when it came out, and you know, we had live, we had tapes of the live shows, and we knew how aggressive those were, right? And so we were like thinking he's going to emulate that aggression on that on that record. And then we pick up the record and we put it on, and it's like this muffled sound, weird. And you know, I'm thinking like, you know, it's going to come out like you know, Seven Churches or some shit, you know. But it's yeah. not. It's like this weird the bottom dropped out, you know, like it's that. And then, you know, I got used to it really quickly, but I mean, we we're like, what, why is this sounding like it does? It's just tingy guitar tone. Like what the fuck is going on? But yeah. nevertheless, going back and even having the record, you know, after a few listens, we we're like, fuck it. This is still aggressive as fuck. So to us, it was still like that Megadeth, that first Megadeth record. Oh, yeah, kill him. You know, like, and the songs on there, like, looking down across and all that shit, when that hit, it was just goosebumps and just, ah. (laughs) And the cover sucked, too. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But in retrospect, but uh, I don't know if you agree, but in retrospect, it's badass. The cover is badass. If you think about it, like nobody did that. Like he just did that. He's like, yeah, I don't want. Let's take a picture. I'm like, yeah, it's awesome. I actually love that old school logo too. Yeah, like um, the original version. The the tattoo Dave was gonna get right because it was the original artwork was gonna be a, a tattoo Dave was gonna get. The 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 skull with the the two the the shit behind it that became the the new uh, album oh, art man. as of recently yeah. that was supposed to be a tattoo and that's the art Dave sent to the artist and I then the artist that. took a picture of some shit <laughs> but I, yeah, that's a good point because I don't think there's really any Who did like that? early thrash metal bands that like it's a like a, a photograph nobody did that yeah matter yeah. of fact we're oh. thinking. I'm thinking about the, you know, I, I'm I'm talking to artists for my new record, our new record, and we're playing with the idea that maybe we'll do that, you know, because that that is not if we can get somebody to replicate our our logo or the mask, in a yeah. way, and that'd be cool, you know, like yeah, we're just kind of playing with the idea, but like I and it all stems from Megadeth doing that. It's stuck in my head too. Like, I bet you could you could probably get a three D printer, put it in there, yeah, something, and then, then just paint it or chrome it, get it chromed out. Or I'm not That's sure if you guys, the final kill, the the new remaster of Killing is literally a photograph. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's just really they they, Megadeth has like a stupid budget nowadays, so they just yeah. they were able to throw a ton of money into want. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's like I saw the behind the scenes. It's li- they literally built the skull and everything, and it's like a black background, and they took a picture, um, which is awesome. Like that's a so so I think that's the best middle ground there because I think that looks better than the last two covers. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but let's keep this going. Uh, we'll definitely touch on Megadeth. I feel with uh, some future picks. So Mark, we're back to you with uh, our number two. Okay. Well, my my number two is I don't have the, the actual uh, demo anymore, but uh, Piranha was uh, Paul's. 
Paul's come back. Uh, and that, that was like, that sounded like he was like Megadeth almost where it was like coming back with a vengeance. It's like, yeah, I'm coming back. And, and, and Paul's great vocals over it. Great, crunchy, thrashy, uh, uh, hot mess, so to speak. Uh, just a brilliant demo. It came out a little later. It was like 88. Uh, but, uh, uh, a lot of local guys that, uh, really fit the bill we're all in even with paul being a, a little bit of a, a wild card at that point too he was really battling um of stuff but uh that song the songs on that one are just crushing it just it's it's a it's a great demo it was well produced and anyway they're just great stuff and i Somebody had rumored that Kirk Hammett had come in and helped out with some of it, but I'm not quite certain. I think there was some rumor, but anyway, uh, it, it, no matter, it's just, it's just a, it's a crushing demo. And I, I, I bring that one to my number two, just because I was thinking about mercenary, but I'm like, yeah, no, nah, I think we got to have Paul in there now after hearing everybody's reminiscences of, of that. I've got the seven inch here. Oh wow! Nice. Well, I got the I got so the demo printed on a seven inch. So, yeah, yeah that's killer but, though. Yeah, that was great though. That's a great pick. Amazing. Yeah, I'm kind of jealous. <laughs> I didn't pick that. That's a that's a good great one. Yeah. That's so good. I, I got to revisit. I had that. worked with Paul. Paul was trying to do a band. And he was going to name it Baylaw, and I actually, you know, he would come over. I had a I I was a. a grappling with my own demons at the time and so was he so we got along really well because we'd be up at three o'clock in the morning trying to you know work on stuff i want to i want a hammer going into a heart you know it's like so we draw this wild shit and uh anyway uh but uh and then i think paul got ser or serious people <laughs> serious people got involved and he was like i'm going to do piranha and that was it so bailoff was short-lived but um, uh, anyway, I'm glad he did because yeah, that was, uh, he, he pulled that together. Piranha was just fucking, just fucking vicious. Loved that. Excellent demo. So fucking good. So good. Cool. All right, Zach, you're up. Speaking of Megadeth, uh, my number two is the last rights demo. Uh, so following that conversation we just had, I mean, that, that demo is insane. Uh, the production is way worse than even killing is my business but i mean at that time when that came out i mean I, I think some of the stuff is even faster than on killing is my business so hearing that in 84 man that's crazy um and i think there were i think there were some more demos out there not from negative not just that one and i can't really find much about them but i know there's a demo version of rattlehead out there that i think i've heard but on this demo is just skull beneath the skin mechanics and last right so I don't really know how many demo tapes they actually put out. Uh, but there's some of these other songs floating around as well. Um, but as a whole, yeah, that, that, that was absolutely insane. And going back to Ruthie's Inn, when they put that demo out, I mean, they did their first show at Ruthie's Inn. And that whole show is on YouTube. So I've been watching that for years. I'm incredibly envious of anybody who was at that uh, to see Kerry King. And uh, I... <sighs> Was it Lee Roush who they had on drums for that? I think maybe. Uh, the guy they had on the demo it wasn't Gar. I'm pretty sure. But Trying yeah, I mean that that entire uh, first show is recorded, and I mean they're playing stuff off of "So Far So Good So What" on that first show. So really cool time, an awesome demo. Uh, very envious of the people who were at Ruthie's Inn. That demo was always attached along with the live tapes that we used to get. Okay. So, so we'd get a live tape and at the end of the tape, they just, somebody put that demo at the end of it. So we'd hear, I mean, almost non recognizable nonsense out of the speakers, but we kind of like, you know, back in the day, I didn't have any standards. I'll just put it on and be like, well, it's just noise, but it's fucking great. And then the yeah. demo, as shitty as it sounds, would be a step up from the live show. So that was oh, yeah, of the end of the, I was like, oh, wow, I can hear the songs. Great. <laughs> what was that? That's, what they That's great. 
Great yeah. pick. Great pick. All right. Mem, you're up. All right. So this is another um, U.S. band that was uh, important for me and for us. Nasty Savage, Wage of Mayhem. Um, our introduction to um, Nasty Savage, who ended up touring Europe with Exumer in 88. Um, I'm talking to Ron right now. I'm, we're thinking of uh, maybe doing some stuff together uh, for uh, some future recordings. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know if you're familiar with Nasty Savage, very original band, especially the first two records and the EP are amazing. I mean, even the third record, I mean, weird band, different sounding, great. Like everything great about, um, and you know, that whole angle that, that Nasty Ronnie brought to, to the scene with the pro wrestling shit. Yeah. Great. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Great album. Yeah. So wow. that, that, that whole, and it, and again, you know, this is all, you got to remember pre internet, nothing. So you have just pictures, no video or anything like you know like nothing made it over there so we had the pictures we had the tapes we had you know and then that record came out with that cover and it's like fuck man look at this cover it's iconic right so and, and then that whole angle that he was playing like it was just nobody did that we just knew you know like we saw pictures from live shows where he's breaking tvs and it's like the fuck is this guy doing and looking so weird and like you know, it was just amazing. And, you know, just an overall important band to the scene and for us. So, yeah, that's my number two. Plus, you had that inside cover that it was like um, like Exodus and all these, these collages of like, I mean, you, and, and you're sitting there listening to this heavy music and you're seeing yourselves and all your friends in these same photo kind of photos, poses. And, all, and it was like such a, I don't know, just like a community like hold and they were from Florida, right? Florida, Florida. Yeah. Florida. So like them and Sabotage, they, yeah. they just had it, and they were yeah. great, great. I mean, Sabotage was excellent, a little, a little lighter, but uh, but yeah, I there I had a great affinity for that record too, and it's just heavy as fuck, and it, but it also it was like they're you know they're on the other side of the country, right. but their scene mirrored what we were experiencing too it just it it, it was a very well-rounded like this is holy cow this is spreading it's not just in our backyard it's it's in it's in germany it's in it's in florida it's fucking new york it's everywhere i'm dem and death and you know all that yeah. you know like i mean that scene was was bumping i mean it was a great scene cannibal corpse came out of florida yep Dude, no. right? Yeah. Animal Corpse is from um uh, upstate New York. Oh, a lot of uh, I feel like Obituaries a lot of obituaries from Florida. Death. Um. Um. Well. Obituary. Yeah. Obituary. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't the guys from Animal Corpse eventually move down to Florida? I think something like that. Could have been, yeah. The they recorded a bunch of shit down there. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very awesome. Very awesome. My uh um. All right, so my pick, it's going to be, we've already talked about it, but the Legacy Demo, 1985, you know, it's just so iconic. It's maybe one of the greatest metal demos of all time. Um, you can probably argue that it's like the number one. Zetro on vocals, the instrumentation also, like the on Burnt Offerings, the flute. Um, I actually really like it. It, it. it sounds way different on the record. I really like how just everything sounds. Of course, the production is not the best, Um but I just think it's it's like if this if this same like like format and 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 energy and lineup was on the legacy album, yep. like I I'd love to to see a timeline where that happened. You know, it's just so fucking good. I would kill like I I'm looking for I'm currently looking for a bootleg of that tape, um, just because it's so fucking good. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, that's it's probably the greatest thrash metal demo of all time easy absolutely yeah. absolutely heavy heavy time and that and the, they were really just 
you could just tell on their trajectory they were playing they were a little bit of that too they were playing kind of the punk and metal they were heavy enough and when they first were coming out they their shtick was they'd wear a little priest collars and that was their deal and they had me paint a backdrop for them uh which i had a story about that where I, big silver pentagram and it's soaked into the my mom's living room floor yeah. and then they came and <laughs> eric and alex came to pick it up and they took it away and they left this six foot round pentagram in my mom's floor so i'm yeah they were gone for the day so i'm scrubbing it and they come home see me trying to get this pentagram out of out of the floor but uh anyway they were yeah it's just a killer band alex skolnick who was classically you know trained and uh, 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 uh joe satriani student and top top notch and they were really they put really well thought out crafted songs but even back then and and you and i were talking earlier about zetro zetro was kind of like the dad of that fam of that little family they were a bunch of kids trying to put this thing together and and uh zetro kept them on point if you were late you you get if you were late to practice you had to pay some money uh they he he got everybody to chip in to to get that demo tape made so you know it was like you, you got to get your 150 bucks or whatever it was from each of the guys some of them he had to go to their parents to get the money because you know they were too young to ask for 150 bucks for whatever what I, I picked the number out of a hat but it was like a certain amount of money but he 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 helped keep that band so together that i think you know getting chuck billy in even chuck was uh, uncertain about being in that position as a singer he didn't he's if you listen to that guilt song i mean you you've heard it right brandon yeah yeah in, in the city or some whatever anyway it's yeah it's like, yeah yeah it's it's not a it's not a testament album not song. at all not By at any all. stretch of the imagination <laughs> and for and for chuck to just go in there and and and, and really take that to another level off of the hands of Zetro so he could go do Exodus. It was almost seamless. It just seemed like no one was going to question it, at least on the Testament side. I mean, they were kind of worried because Zetro was so uh, integral to that. Uh, that yeah. Um, you know, what I think, though, is, is um, I mean, Testament blew up and Exodus didn't, as usual. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like like as per usual, Exodus thinking, you know, they're making these m major moves and they get Zetro in the band, and then Pleasures comes out and everybody's like, eh. Yeah. Eh. Yeah, but you but at the time mm -hmm. when the bands were coming out and blowing up, mm -hmm. I mean, they were just sure footed and uh, where Exodus they were on fire locally playing. Yeah. You know, I mean, they were the band to beat. Like you could, Exodus played with when Metallica came up. Exodus held their own. Yeah. I mean, and Exodus played with them on New Year's Eve and blew Metallica off the stage. I mean, Eve, they they would never play with Metallica. Would never have them on the bill again after that because they were such a force to be reckoned with. They right. were so tight. They had been doing this why metallica you know lars was beating on 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 cardboard boxes right, right, right. And they were honing what they had done they had done this for a while the album was that the the problem of yeah. getting it out and yeah. that was business where they were not business type people if you have yeah. paul bailoff running the ship you know you may get to the island but you're gonna right. see a lot of sea monsters on the way you know <laughs> And where they those guys metallic and the other guys just had it on point but yeah i mean yeah anyway it, it's that the the chemistry and the and the ingredients of that stew in the bay area was like exodus always is the center point there they they were the the centrifugal force whether whether you you know recognize it or not and they i think they stumbled and it it, it was just an un unfortunate series of events that just for the grace of god they would be 
they would be the on top and the other guys would be the the big three or the yeah. slightly smaller three yeah yeah yeah, I'm really happy we're uh, we're able to do this because I feel like we're all coming from such different places here where a lot of times, you know, people will do some uh, a show like this and it all kind of comes from nostalgia. But I feel like since we're all coming from such different places, you know, um, I, I find it even more interesting, you know, talking about all these things because it's not just nostalgia, you know, like I kind of and, and I, I feel like me and Zach, you know, we kind of all listen to this stuff at once. You know, um, like we heard, we kind of heard the studio stuff and then the demos opposed yep. to the other way around. Um, so I think it's a really cool perspective um, with all of us talking back and forth. Um, now, we are at our number one picks now. So we're just going to start with Mark and work our way around our number one demo well, from the 80s. Like I assumed that my number one was already every other other people's number two or number three and legacy demo is just it we we've just discussed it it's just the uh it's the be all end all of of demo tapes for me and uh uh i i it what more can be said i mean we really just uh uh dug deep onto that one and it, it it fits in the parthenon of uh, of all the different uh you know ones twos threes fours or fifths favorites but it's always in there somewhere uh and it just happened to be mine and it was the one that uh you know i i had a lot of experience going and seeing them doing flyers for them uh went to high school for one year with with alex uh he even you know convinced me to try my hand at getting uh auditioning to be a student for satriani uh and thankfully satriani saw right through me and suggested i try other hobbies uh so i took to drawing instead and then bless his heart i, I wish i didn't have to pay the 20 dollars to get that in, advice but there it is so i did that and those guys are great and 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 they're still top top notch uh crushing band live to this day, and I would see a Testament show over a Metallica show, sorry, any day of the week. Uh, they they never disappoint. Definitely, definitely. I've got a New World Order shirt, actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> fucking amazing. So good. Nobody's fault doing a, a fucking Aerosmith cover on, on that. And it's just <laughs> crushing. Crushing. <laughs> Yeah, the skull is cool though, but you can barely fucking see it. Yeah, well, I I, yeah. I did I worked at Tower Records and I had to do a display and I would do a lot of the local bands and and uh, that new order when that came out and I tried to use a can of blue spray paint to get the skull and and let me tell you the cover looks hell better than what I came up with. I was <laughs> but, but Chuck still wanted it for his, his his garage, so I think it's still hanging in his garage. But wow! I got the lo I got the logo looking good, but yeah, that skull looked like ass, a blue ass floating <laughs> over the earth. Has uh, has the band ever reissued that demo on cassette? Does any of you know that? Know if they've done that? No. No. They sh they I, should. I haven't heard of anything. I I mean, there's so many releases come out like bootlegs it's hard to tell, but I don't think they ever have. I, I was actually just thinking that while I was prepping for this, it was like, why didn't they just do that? Why didn't, why didn't a lot of these bands just, I mean, Sacrilege did it for record store day for the party with God album. They actually put their demo on vinyl, which I think is great. And, 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 uh, uh, seeing, seeing those old demos that you have on vinyl or, or that that's great that that's what i would love to see yeah. even if, they, if do it as a do it as vinyl yeah yeah especially that demo like so iconic very very iconic all right zach your number one pick uh number one and i i didn't pick any of these for a particular order of favoritism or anything but um i was gonna say one demo but i'm changing my mind because i feel like somebody else might say it so i'm gonna go with uh Technically not a demo, kind of Abominations of Desolation by Morbid Angel. It was oh, supposed yeah, yeah. to be their first record, but it didn't actually come out because uh, 
they fired their drummer vocalist and then re-recorded the whole thing with uh Pete Sandoval and David Vincent. But the quality, uh, I mean, it it was supposed to come out in '86, and the quality in comparison to the final product, Ultra's Madness, let's say it, it sounds more like it would be a demo, and it's all the same songs, just uh not as refined and with a different lineup. Um, but if that were to had come out, that probably would have been one of the first true death metal records to ever come out. Uh, I mean, possessed Adam beat for by like a year, but that's still super thrashy. In my opinion, this stuff was definitely what, uh, more, more in that death metal direction that we'd known now. Um, so again, not necessarily a demo, but, uh, in my book, if you look at it now, uh, it, it kind of fits those qualifications with the quality and, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's really, really cool stuff on that. Great choice. That's an awesome, awesome. I mean, the Morbid Angel, the that recording, and then the um, the debut and Bless It. Those three in a row are like that is the blueprint for in my book what is death metal as we know it. Mm-hmm. Death, like you said, even Death and Possessed. I mean, Possessed came up with the term, you know they had a song called Death Metal. Yeah. So, um, but it's not that what we know as of death metal, what it actually is with the blast beats and everything, right? So um, same with death. Death was like death metal, but very thrashy, right? Um, yeah. In a sense, that is a, a step above those bands. And I love everything. I mean, those abominations, uh, altars and blessed to me are like, that's death metal. Like that's when when it started. Like that's that's the beginning of what we know, what I consider death metal. So I amazing. totally agree with you. My favorite death metal band, probably uh, huge inspiration on my guitar playing as a whole. And uh, yeah, I uh, I mean that would have came out in '86, so they would have even had death beat. I mean, Morbid Angel I think formed in '83, and they were doing this stuff wow. forever. They just took super long to get an actual first album out but they were doing it i think before death was i mean possessed was definitely playing around that same time but not nothing out yet uh yeah they they were i I don't think people acknowledge that they were playing in like playing shows i think in like 83 84 but they didn't put out a record till what 89 or 89 89 alters yeah Yeah, i think death was 88 yeah. yeah. Is that abomination of that version of abomination that you're talking about? Is that available? Like some vinyl. You can get it. You can get a earache put it out. I have bootlegs uh, on vinyl. Like you can get that quite easily. Oh, cool. Yeah, I've I think, only it, I seen think them it's once too. and they blew me away, but I never delved further. I, I saw Carcass once and I saw Morbid Angel once and impressed the shit out of me but i i was like it was like jazz i needed to you know figure my way into it otherwise i could you know fuck up and then and go go off into ornette coleman line or something but but yeah morbid angel is always one that i wanted to dip my toe into because i really liked that so abomination i should start at the beginning you can yeah, definitely i think you should it's really cool yeah it's really cool too uh because they had uh mike browning doing drums and vocals simultaneously simultaneously on that uh release so that okay. yeah that's just sick here and drummers doing vocals at the same time i actually saw him recently with the uh made a band after morbid angel called nocturnus uh, i saw them two years ago and they played a song off of abomination which was oh. awesome to hear him still doing it that's rad i saw morbid I'm learning, angel I'm learning loads oh, now i feel good <laughs> i'm like oh man i <laughs> fucked up man i needed to yeah <laughs> So, such an amazing band. Uh, Zach, did you see them in Worcester a year ago? No, uh, they came to Worcester? No. They came to Worcester with Crypto, yeah. They were fucking oh, awesome. Man, I didn't, I didn't it even was, know that happened. Wow. It was on the, the Curse tour where uh, a, a few people died on tour. Uh, one of the yeah, gigs, it was good. hit by a tornado or something, and the venue caved in. This oh, was like shit. last year. Yeah, crazy. Wait, I thought that was Morbid Angel. Yeah. It was nocturnal. Yeah, oh no. Oh, Morbid Angel. Morbid Angel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they yeah, yeah, they yeah, were uh, with Crypto. No, I didn't see 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, they're still awesome. Like it's, it's so awesome that so many of these bands like still almost like sometimes even sound better nowadays, which is so cool, you know, with, especially with how hard the shit is to play. Oh yeah. Like I, I saw can't imagine. Once. I saw him once they like opened with, I think it was for Slayer and Pantera or something. It was like 90 something or whatever, but man, the P they, their kids coming out of that pit on stretchers. That that was way before Slayer Pantera even got, and I was like, "There's not gonna be anybody left, man. These guys are brutal." <laughs> I was like, "Holy oh. cow!" There's like probably maybe 15 people left after that. I was like, "Oh shit, man! There's nobody left to thrash." <laughs> but it was it was brutal. They were just so good too. So good, ma'am. You have the floor. Your number one pick. All right. So I gave it some thoughts, and um, I went. The picks that I did today were based on how much I would listen to them, right? So when it, when I first heard those demos and, and how often I would play them. This demo, I definitely played the most. Hellhammer. Hellhammer, Satanic Rites. Um, it's a step above um, Death Fiend and Triumph of Death because the production is better. I think the songs are more cohesive and it sounds like they're on their way. Right. Which is funny because when the EP dropped, it was a reversal almost to the um, first two demos. But Satanic Rights was, um, for me, the pivotal recording. Now, obviously, I have a story about that, too. So I got into this uh, into the band and then the guy who was running their fan club was. Uh, was uh, living in a town close to Frankfurt. Um, so I saw him and then he's, he worked for Metal Hammer in 84. So I met him at a, some local shows around Frankfurt. And I told him, hey man, I'm a huge Hellhammer um, fan. So we started talking on the phone, da, 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 da. And then um, he would go back and forth to Switzerland to hang out with Tom and everybody else from Hellhammer. And... Um, and then um, he he was the catalyst for me to uh, for me starting to work at Metal Hammer, and then I eventually met Celtic Frost uh, in '85 uh, on their very first tour, um, and um, then uh, we we traveled with them, and um, during that tour. Tom approached me when we were hanging out every day. It was a short lived tour and Tom had approached me. He knew that I was playing bass and he said, could you imagine playing, you know, for some tracks or maybe on a record because him and Martin were going through some stuff. And I was a little kid. I was like 16, I was 17 at the time. And I was like, yeah, obviously it never became, it, you know, we, 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 we continued talking to each other on the phone. I would talk to his mom a lot. I remember calling uh, and his mom would pick up and we were talking. Oh, she would be very, very friendly lady. Um, anyway, it never led to anything. Martin stayed in the band. Actually, around that time, Martin dropped out of the band because they had so many problems, internal problems. And um, this other guy, Dominic, recorded two Megatherian. And then... Um, Martin rejoined the band. Um, anyway, long story short, I reconnected with Tom and for their um, very uh, first uh, Hellhammer um, show in Frankfurt. I was on tour and um, in Germany and they played in this tiny club and uh, I went to see the show. Um, very first Hellhammer concert ever. And then after the show, I went up to Tom and I said, I don't know if you remember me, but, you know, and then I told him and he's like, God damn. Yeah. And then we reconnected and now we're, you know, talking to each other on on uh, Instagram and whatnot. And uh, so that's my story about Frost, Hellhammer, the whole bit, and how I really, you know, that band was kind of like how I got connected to this scene on a grander um, level and on a broader level with working for Metal Hammer. Everything comes from that. I mean, started with that tape, really, for me to, 
you know, having access, you know, to all these other bands and these other, other forms of media. And we remember, this is now 84, you know, 1984, 85, no internet, no nothing. So, um, yeah. So that's my story about that. Hence, number one. Wow. That's amazing. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. a great story. That's a great story. Now, uh, before we go into number one, I just want to say, I just want to say, it's, no one did Metallica. No yeah, one did Metallica. That's gonna be the one I was gonna do. Yeah. Why do you uh, decide not? Because I figured that'd be probably yours. <laughs> I uh. So my number one is actually Megadeth. Last ah, Rites. Ah, okay, close. Um, close. I think this thing fucking rips. When I first heard it, it blew my mind. If I was a kid, and I and someone gave me this, and I didn't know Megadeth. This would have ruined my life. It's so fucking good. You know, it's like people give Dave shit on vocals and stuff, but it's so he sounds so fucking angry. The snarl in his voice, it's thrash metal. It is like the embodiment of thrash metal. And I'll be honest, man, the No Life to Leather or whatever, the I cannot stand James's vocals on that demo. He, he's trying to be like he's trying to be like Diamond Head. He's, he's it, there's a lot of like new wave of British heavy metal influences in his voice, oh. and he's still figuring it out. Where Dave is like, you know, he he's like, he wants to kill. It sounds it, there is so much aggression and fucking yet. anger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which makes sense, you know. But the the playing is like so fast, and it's like uh, exactly what Mem was saying. It's like. If if this shit was on the record, you know, where it's like the 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 feel, I guess, you know, it is like it was so there. And I, and I wish that translated onto the album. Um, but mechanics, what is a, it, it's a four song de- or uh, three songs, three. I yeah. believe. Yeah, yeah. And it's uh, it's got mechanics um, and true. like last rights, obviously. It's just such such a fucking good thing I, and the production sucks but they all suck but i honestly um it's probably one of besides legacy where like i'll usually listen to this before maybe killing um just because it's like it's so fucking good um and just like young dave and and uh i think uh gar was on that on the, the last right uh, um, maybe I, i'd look into it because i think they had the guy Lee Roush still doing like fill in drums. He wasn't officially in the band. Um, then Gar came in shortly after that. So I'm pretty sure the drums are more straightforward, kind of punk metal drums. There wasn't yeah. a lot of um, jazzy flair on those demo songs. So uh, I mean, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was that guy Lee Roush. You're probably right. I'm just looking at uh, um, the uh, the metal archives here, but I don't know. They're, uh, they're the, usually the they. Dark- they're usually wrong with demos. Um, but you know, I don't, but yeah, it's just such a fucking good demo, man. It's like, I'd kill to have an original of one of those. I've never seen one even online. Me neither. Yeah. Me neither. It sounds like he got kicked out of Metallica. You know what I mean? (laughs) It does. It's like, I am going to fucking kill you guys with music. And it's like, See, the like, other thing well, tell them all sound like if Lars got fired, you know. <laughs> the, the other thing <laughs> you got to remember, though, I think, um, you know, uh, Dave is instrumental for for Metallica's songwriting and everything. Yeah, you know, and stage presence. Yeah, so I think, yeah. I think, I think, um, a lot of that gets lost in the mix. You know, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, you know, Metallica this. And, that. and I don't want to crap on Metallica. I, I got to, yeah, you know, it's it's like, but I always say Metallica to me is a band that had three really good records, the first three. And the fourth was okay in retrospect, but I did, I, I checked that. When that dropped, when yeah. Justice dropped, I, I was already checked out. And then I listened to it and I was like, oh yeah, this is shit. Because because of the sound of the drums and like everything, and then they had a ballad on there, like one was on there, you know, like I mean, they had other songs 
that were similar to you know, at sanitarium and all that but okay. one was like full on now you're like losing me like you know and um i don't know um but they never like megadeth uh especially on those first two records yep. um they already crushed metallica like uh, on on the uh, on the uh, on the aggression tip, right? They 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 were already beyond what what Metallica had to offer in that sense. Because I mean, my favorite Metallica record is Ride, and Ride is polished. Like it's a That's very well polished. thought out, well written record. Still, now because of Cliff, yeah, still yes, Cliff is in there. You can tell, you know, it's still driving. Yeah, but. You know, um, there's there's no like, you know, I want to be like King Grimson and write fifteen minute songs, long songs. What about Escape? And, yeah, that's a good song though. Yeah, that's yeah. a great song. I like it. Uh, Hatfield hates it. He said it was like a filler song at the last minute. It doesn't matter. It's still yeah. it's part of that record, and and I think I think. Um, you know, that's as, as close as they would get to me. Ride is as, as close as it gets to what Megadeth already had, like, oh, yeah, for ahead well, of the game, you know. In Dave had of- that, he had the personality, he was the front guy. I mean, La- James was an introvert, he didn't even really want to play guitar, he didn't want to, he, he, and singing was really, I, I think he had a harder time with that, but he was quite an introvert. So at those beginning times, Dave was leading the charge, and this is before you know uh, Cliff was in the band, and 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 then uh, and when they got Cliff, now you got two front guys, so James could kind of like yeah. just be in the center part. He wasn't the fr- he wasn't the main guy until, I mean, really the focal point until Dave was out of the band. And I, Dave I was in your face always playing. I mean, he was a showman. He had that aggression. Where you know they're playing heavy songs, but it's like Dave was the face of that. Lars was too far back to talk; he couldn't get on. You know, he, he he's he's in the back. He he. And then, anyway, I I just Dave was that 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 engine that you know that if they hadn't got and they went to the Exodus well again, you know, and they and they got you know uh, Kirk, but even Kirk took a little while to get into that 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 kind of level. And I think it leveled out the playing field work uh, on, on their stage. But uh, uh, again, I think uh, Dave had, a, he was on a mission and yeah, they kicked him out of the band and that hurt. And he's, he plays and that demo is like, that's, that sounds like you just got kicked out of Metallica. That's sad. He's angry. He's out for blood on that one. And then I think once things started rolling and he got into the studio. I mean, who knows what happened in the studio? I'm sure that's something that maybe Ellison could uh, expound upon. But I, I it, you know, it is also a, it's a different thing too. If you're out for blood and you're on stage and you take it, you, it, you might not be able to replicate that on a on an album. I mean, not to that fullest like, <laughs> like you wanted to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's so interesting because I feel I I know Dave and and other you know Megadeth alumni have said that the uh, Megadeth was supposed to especially Killing was supposed to be more like way slower was supposed to yeah. be like Black Sabbathy slow and then I think a fan wrote to Dave and was like Hey, I hope you're faster. Brian than Lou. Ki- oh yeah, yeah. It was yeah. Brian Lou said Hey, because he was close with Metallica, but he's also close with Megadeth, and uh, he told him he goes you got to listen to what Metallica is playing. And, and it, they, apparently according to Ellison, I think it was Ellison or, or Dave, they went, it was Ellison because Dave would probably never agree, uh, uh, admit to it, but they went right back in and re-recorded and sped everything up. Like, I mean, I think Brian talks about it in that murder in the front row movie. Yeah. Um, I believe it was like, I, I believe he said, I hope you're, you guys are faster than kill them all or something. It was something yeah, like you that. You got to bring think. your A game on this one. And he said, they went right back in and started <laughs> speed it up, man. Speed it up. Let's step it up the pace. Well, well, I'm glad he wrote that letter. Honestly, personally. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, hey, uh, this has been awesome. Uh, this is we almost clocking it at two hours here, so I appreciate <laughs> everyone's patience. Uh, now, uh, before we go, I just want to go around, and if any of you have anything to plug, you know, I know, ma'am, you talked about there might be some new Exumer stuff in the works. Yeah. So uh, we'll start with uh, we'll start with Mem, and we'll go around from there. Yeah. So we're pretty much at the end stages of writing and everything, like you know shoring up the last bits of what we need to do so um we're looking at the end of april beginning of may to finally record which has been a five-year um lag between records but uh nevertheless we're finally ready coming out of the stupid pandemic um so yeah so that's going to be in the works uh summer festival tour in europe and then uh and then uh figuring out when to drop that new record once we hand it into metal blade. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's on my agenda. Awesome. Mark. Uh, oh shit. Um, I just, I mean, I, I'm do freelance graphics. So I just finished Exodus's live album packaging, uh, working for Coven doing some album packaging for them. Um uh what else i've been working with forbidden greg craig lasistro and uh and the boneless ones guys um the only thing i got really to plug is uh, uh those meddling kids um and i'm trying to build some some networking and the possibilities of uh of putting a podcast together with that uh bringing in some people and and talking and having fun with it but I wanted to also just take this time to thank you guys. This was great, Zach, ma'am, and uh, and Steve. Of course, I'm sorry he had to take off so early, but this has been awesome, man. Thank you guys so much for including me, and and I appreciate it. And oh, I learned yeah. a lot from everybody, yeah. which is great. Me too, now man. I got, I got my my new shopping list, man. I'm, I'm stoked. I, I have a I, I literally have a list written of the demos I need to listen to. And I've been writing down. I've been writing stuff <laughs> down, man. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Zach, anything uh, with uh, Maidenhead in the works? Yeah, i uh, got a lot of potential stuff. Uh, talking with a specific label about signing up. And then um, I know a management team is going to be looking at our stuff as well. I can't tell you if we're going to get on those or not, but hopefully. Um, and then I'm hoping we'll have a new single out around May or June. And got a couple big announcements around that time as well for some stuff going on post May. Uh, a very big announcement that's going to come for something going on in uh, late August, early September. Then hopefully going to do another single mid summer. And then hopefully going to have a new record at the end of the year if everything goes uh, according to plan. Hell yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you guys so much for doing this. This has been a ton of fun. Um, awesome. I'm Brandon thank Baddock. Of course, I'm Rena Baddock, and this is Disturbing the Priest. Uh -huh.